welcome to another episode of the Star Local Media High School Sports Podcast. My name is Matt Welch, being joined by Devin Hassan and David Woolman. It is 11.20 a.m. on a Monday morning. When we uh, when we left off last week's episode of the podcast, the, uh, the big question, would we have a team to preview this week for the UIL <laughs> State Basketball Championships? We had only two teams left in our coverage area as of last week, two teams that were bound for the, uh, for the regional finals, the Frisco Liberty Girls and the Plano East Girls. Would we see one of them advance? or two of them advance to um, to the very next week for the final week of the season and play for a state title. Devin, are we really surprised <laughs> anymore that it's gotten to this point with Liberty? They, Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> for the third straight year, the Lady Red Hawks are bound for the state championship game in Class 5A. They'll get to defend their championship. Seldom do you get to see that. But um, Liberty will get a chance to defend its 5A state title, I believe, what, a Wednesday, uh, 6, a, uh, 6 p.m. tip-off down at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio versus the number one ranked team in 5A, Cedar Park. Um, so, yeah, I mean, Devin, obviously I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you a little bit to talk about this. But um, obviously Liberty coming off a very thrilling game in their state semifinal, a game that kind of looks pretty part and parcel for uh, several games that they had during <laughs> last year's run to a state title as they defeated Lubbock Cooper 39-30. Uh, Seven in overtime. Um, I mean, what more can we really say at this point about the Lady Red Hawks? Is they just continue to be just it's just death taxes and this team making deep playoff runs? Yeah, and, and it's just they find ways to win. I mean, it's it, it's not necessarily the, the prettiest brand of basketball. Sometimes it's just um, you know you know, but they they just they just know how to win, and that's something you can't teach. It's something that it's just uh, they've shown it time and time again. Uh, you know. You know, Jazzy Owens Barnett hit the game winner, and she's no stranger to big moments. Mm-hmm. The title game MVP a year ago, uh, but they just you know from, from from watching this team through the playoffs, they have so many players that can hurt you. Uh, you know, Ashley Anderson had a huge game against Wiley East, uh, scored 18 points in that game uh, last week. You know, uh, Maya Jane came in Wong, uh, Journey Chambers, a transfer from Saxe, who stepped right in and and. Um, become a key part of that rotation. Uh, Zilli, uh, Lily Zimkowitz comes off the bench, but basically plays starters minutes. Yeah. And, and all those players can hit from the outside. And, and that makes them dangerous because they can spread the floor on you. And then you have Jazzy Owens Barnett. If they're they got the shooters on the outside, she can get, she can create her own shot anytime she wants to. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, that's what she was able to do there late in the game against Lubbock Cooper. Uh, you know, they're just, they're so deliberate. They're so patient. It, it's, it's, it's not uncommon for them to hold the ball for 90 seconds on offense, just working the ball around. They don't they don't rush. They they, they don't force things up. Mm-hmm. They just work the ball around until they get the shot they want. Uh, but the big thing is the defense, I think, and, and that's kind of their hallmark. Uh, and that's going to be a key this week. And you know, you, you we were talking before we started filming. You know, the number one Cedar Park. They've rolled over everybody. You know what? That doesn't matter. <laughs> you know, they've already beaten four state ranked teams mm-hmm. in the in this year's playoff run. They did the same thing last year. Uh, but you know, again, it's they they peak at their work time in the defense. If you look at uh, you know, 2019 when they made it to the state uh, finals, uh, lost they lost that game to Amarillo. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that was a team that lost. 11 games, 10 prior to the start of the playoffs. Uh, but late in the game, uh, late in the season, they won 15 in a row. And during that 15-game winning streak, the defense allowed 23.7 points per game. I mean, it was just <laughs> it, last season, they won the state championship. Guess how many losses they had? 11. <laughs> you know, they, they take early in the season, they, they work different players in. They, they, they take their lumps sometimes because they're, they're not worried about wins and losses. They're worrying about, uh, you know, improving. Well, last season they won 10 of their last 11, mm-hmm. uh, allowed 33.1 points per game. And then obviously, you know, just the, the, the games they had during that playoff run, you know, 32 to 31 against Centennial, against the, their, their crosstown rival, 42 to 36 against Red Oak, three overtimes against Middle Othian, overtime against College mm-hmm. Station. Um, and they're and they're really just kind of doing the same thing, you know. This year, uh, getting hot at the right time, uh, you know, limiting your opponents, you know, to, to basically twenty six points a game during this uh, during this late. Uh, let's say they've won fifteen and sixteen. They, they've allowed twenty four point nine points per game mm-hmm. uh, during this stretch, and uh, it, and I, I, you know, again, it's it's you know, I know what the rankings say, but are you going to bet against them <laughs> based on what you've seen the last three years in the playoffs? And when you have a player like Jazzy Owens-Barnett mm-hmm. that can take over? 
because you can't convince me that, like, with, you know, you think back to last season during that playoff run, that team played four overtime periods <laughs> last season. So you can't tell me that you don't build a mental toughness and a mental fortitude for those moments after having gone through them time and time again and just being able to really kind of develop the composure and just the collectiveness that it takes to, you know, to not panic if you have a turnover or if, you know, if you get a you take a bad shot or whatnot. I mean, so much about closing out tough playoff games is being able to steady yourself mentally and for a team that has been that they've seen it all i mean it's just and it's so much of that experience so many of their players went through those fires last season jazzy lily uh, maya jane uh, ashley anderson i mean it's so much of experience experiences back from that team that i mean yes and the numbers on cedar park they're gaudy oh yeah yeah they're impressive that is a team that's lost one game all season it was a two-point loss back in mid-november to cibolo steel they've um they've won i want to say what is it like 22 in a row 24 and 24 in a row and only one of those games has been decided by single digits i mean yeah. they're killing everybody their average margin of victory in the playoffs 30.7 points per game and they've knocked off like the number five team in the state number six team in the state they're crushing powerhouse teams and getting to this point but at the same time this is also their deepest playoff run ever so this is their first appearance in the state championship game their first time playing in the alamo dome and it's different down there it's yeah. different. Oh, if you yeah. ever covered a game down there and you see, I mean, it's it's you're not shooting in a gym anymore. You know, you're shooting in a full blown arena. The basket looks different. It feels different because of the vantage point and whatnot. And the atmosphere is going to be different. And obviously, I'm sure there's going to be reduced crowd, so it's not going to be the same volume as uh, as normal. But it's the atmosphere is not it's not your typical playoff game. So for a team that is going through this for the first time versus a team that's making its third consecutive trip there, you can't tell me that's not an advantage in favor of Liberty in this for all of the firepower. That Cedar Park has in its favor, um, that there is just this little intangible quality about Liberty with having been through the uh, through those battles time and time again that might be enough to make this one to make them be the team that can finally figure out how to solve this Cedar Park juggernaut that no one has come close to touching at the five A level. Yeah, and, and you know I mentioned you know I'm talking about Liberty's records coming in. Mm-hmm. You know they're they're unranked this year uh, again. You know yeah. coming into the playoffs, they don't care about that, and no. they're not going to be intimidated because they're used to being on paper the underdog. They're used to having people ask them, hey, you're going against number eight, you know, last week, number one, this, number... They don't care about that. They've been there. Mm-hmm. They know how to win in those situations. They're not going to be intimidated. Um, you, you know, you mentioned shooting in the Alamo Dome. That was, we, you know, that uh, Liberty had the very... Uh, Frisco Liberty and Lubbock Cooper had the very curious San Antonio destination <laughs> uh, to, to uh, you know, I, we, you know, I guess they couldn't find a college... Uh, <laughs> College gym that they could Within between, between, hours. between <laughs> Lubbock and Dallas yeah. Fort Worth, um, but you mentioned go they they did get that experience or get mm. you know kind of going down to to play to you know in San Antonio kind of get that feel. It's not going to a high school gym like you say because the Alamo Dome is a totally different animal when it turns mm-hmm. just the the dimensions it takes oh, yeah. it takes some getting used to out there, you know to do that. But you know they had the experience of having been there last year. Uh, some of those girls were there two years ago, so you know they're not they're not going to be scared off by Cedar Park's record or what they've done to, to their opponents. I, I expect another another close game, and uh, I mean, I, again, like I said earlier, how are you going to bet against them? <laughs> it, it really is a fun matchup on paper because, again, for all the I mean, just these gaudy numbers that work in Cedar Park's favor in this matchup, the number one ranked team in the state, and there really hadn't been much doubt about that up to this yeah. point. And then it's Liberty, the defending state champion, but just such an unassuming team that just grinds its ways to win after win and they just have this way of luring you into their style into their tempo and they can bring out the absolute worst in an opponent it's so impressive how it just year after year they continue to thrive with this style of play um so yeah it should be a good one that one six o'clock wednesday out at the alamo dome in san antonio the 5a state championship game frisco liberty versus cedar park should be a should be a doozy um we also had just some a couple quick notes otherwise um in the in the basketball scene because because the um, we did have one other team, at least at the UIL level, that was playing for the uh, the chance to potentially get to the regional final, maybe then get I'd get to the I should say to the state semifinal. 
I'm sorry. And that was Plano East. You know, in Plano East, like this team, I need to see next time I'm in the Plano East Gymnasium, find the banner up on the in the rafters and see what that 1993 team's win-loss record was and see how it compares to this. And granted, it's tough because, you know, obviously this was a shortened season with no tournaments and whatnot. Um, but, I mean, this Plano East girls team, you know, whose run came to an end last week in the regional finals against South Grand Prairie, they matched the deepest playoff run in program history again, first time since 1993 that an East team had been this deep in the playoffs. And, I mean, they certainly have staked their claim as being one of the best teams to ever come through there, if not the best. And, you know, when you look back, I mean, just years down the road at this team's resume and how they got to this point, you're going to see those two games against South Grand Prairie. And, you know, for as incredible a job as this Plano East team did defensively all season, there's only one team in the state that managed to score more than 50 points on them all season long, and it was South Grand Prairie. They played Duncanville. They played DeSoto. DeSoto, who's playing for a state championship this week. Um, And whether it's just a case of the old adage of styles make fights, but um, getting to see it firsthand, you know, they um, obviously East and South Grand Prairie played in the preseason, and SGP won that game 69-53. to And fast forward to last week, and not a ton really has changed. That (laughs) style of theirs and just that relentless aggression um, that they play with, it just, it really gives Plano East a lot of trouble. And this was one that, it actually started off super positive. You know, East came out, they were up 12-4, to moving the ball well. You know, SGP's shot was a little cold to begin, and then SGP gets a couple threes falling, and then the basket became the size of the friggin' ocean. (laughs) And it's just, that's what they need. I mean, it's a team that can string together these ridiculous runs. Runs. They've done it all postseason. They've typically come in the fourth quarter. Well, they saved it for the first half of this one when they really blew the game open with a 19 to two run. And that just kind of, I mean, that buried East, you know, East was able to, you know, they were able to at least make it look respectable at points in the fourth quarter. They were able to cut their deficit, which got, I think, as high as 22, 24. They cut it all the way down to like nine points inside the final minute. But ultimately, again, just too, dig, too uh, deep a hole that they dug themselves. Um, SGP's defense was just lights out. I mean, the job that they did, just how fast they are, how fast they rotate. They were throwing multiple bodies down low. Um, they were switching on a lot of screens on the perimeter, which really didn't allow anything open as far as attack lanes and whatnot for Plano East. And they just, their offenses could not generate much in the way of just clean, respectable offense. And that's a testament to an SGP team that has, you know, they're, I mean, they got a lot of senior presence in their, uh, in their backcourt. I believe four of their five starters are seniors. And it's a team that's been on the doorstep in recent years of trying to break through and get to the state semi finals they finally did so and now with this Plano East team looking ahead um, that's kind of now the the bar because that's the the beauty of this team is that every single player that was part of their playoff rotation is either a sophomore or a junior they're going to run this entire thing back next season and you know it's uh you know they were able to um they exited last season with a lot of these with pretty much the same team and that was the goal was okay like we're not going to stay we're not going to be stagnant we're going to build off of this we're going to move forward so they took that second round appearance turn it into a regional finals berth. Well, the next step from there is getting a state. So it's pretty wild to think for the first time in, I cannot recall how long the last time a Plano East team entered a season with a state tournament expectation, but um, that's, that's the next step for this team. Yeah. And then we'll, uh, yeah, we'll see if they can follow through with it. But yeah, nevertheless, so even though the run comes to an end in the regional finals, still an incredible season for Plano East as they match their deepest playoff run ever. And then, um, Devin, we also have a couple teams still kicking around at the private school level. Uh, John Paul, uh, the second, their boys team, still alive in the hope for a back-to-back state championship. And I believe you said the Dallas Christian girls mm-hmm. are still playing as well. Um, JP2, their, uh, their boys team, they play in the state semis tomorrow night at, I believe it's at Prosper Rock Hill, a 7.30 tip against Bishop Lynch. Um, this uh, this might be where I haven't decided entirely where I'm headed tomorrow night for my game coverage, but this might be the, uh, the pick just because of the nature of this matchup, despite um, John Paul and the number one state ranking and just the absolute, just insane record, they've only lost one game for the second straight season. <laughs> At this point, they went 40 and one last year. Their only loss came to Waxahachie, who was the number one ranked team in 6A, um, you know, for most of the regular season. Um, but they've won, I believe, 22 in a row. 
But Lynch has been a bit of a – they've pushed them a bit more than any other team in the state has shown to be able to. Their two regular season meetings in district play, 56-50 to 50 and 80-79. to 79. The latter of those two was won on a game winner in the closing seconds by Jalen Tyson. And, you know, JP's won 22 in a row. They've got – I mean, obviously their, their top two players are better than just about any top two in the state with Jalen Tyson and Manny Obasecki. Um, but you, you go back to that cliche of how it's tough to beat a team three times in a row. And I think back to, you know, a few years ago when Allen won its state championship in boys basketball, they did so the one of the signature wins along that path came in the regional finals when they took down the number one ranked team in the state, Denton Geyer. Now, Allen and Geyer were in the same district that year, and Geyer won both regular season meetings, and they did so basically by... Allen's a very up-tempo team, and they tried to play that same style with a Geyer team that also thrived in that, except they did so with, you know, four- and five-star caliber athletes, <laughs> and naturally Geyer won that game. So then you get to the regional finals, and then Allen completely flipped the script and took a completely different game plan and slowed the game down to a, a snail's pace at times, it felt like, and that really flummoxed Geyer. So, you know, I just I think back to that all the time as far as the difficulties that it can take to beat a team three times in a row, especially when you've seen that team twice during district play and you have at least a built-in sense of how to play with that team so i'm curious to see how this one goes tomorrow night if um if the third time is the charm for lynch or if this jp2 juggernaut's going to keep marching on to state for a uh, for i guess the this would be i guess the um what the second consecutive year i guess yeah they'd be if they'd be back because yeah they got to the semis um you know two years prior so there's still that um what does the road look like right now for the dallas christian girls uh, you yeah, know, they have Fort Worth uh, Southwest Christian, uh, a 23-1 and one team. Mm. Uh, Dallas Christian uh, comes in, they'll come into a game with a 17-6 and six record. Uh, you know, battle-tested. They're, they're, they lost to John Paul um, which in a close in a close game at a bigger mm. school in yeah. John Paul. Uh, they lost to Sunnyvale, who's, you know, number four team in, in 4A, uh, perennial, you know, playoff team. Um, and they lost to Bishop Lynch. So, you know, they, they played good competition. It's really hard to tell how they match up, but this may be – Dallas Christian is mostly freshmen and sophomores. Mm-hmm. They have one senior, but this could be – I don't know what the – I know the expectation level is high. This is a program that won a state championship a few years ago, mm-hmm. and it's been in the running um, several times as well. But, you know, just looking at that roster, I don't know what the expectation level was in terms of – a, is this going to be our year because we're so young? So it's been an incredible run. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens um, uh, in the in the semifinals. Uh, but it's certainly a team that is poised, even if they don't get the ultimate prize this mm-hmm. this this season, is poised. You know, for a two or three year run, they're going to be right there every year. So that is a um, that's kind of a look at where things stand right now for the remainder of our basketball slate for the week. Um, wanted to devote the rest of the podcast to just playing a little bit of catch up with um, you know with relation to our uh, our springtime sports because you know as as we still have a couple teams still hanging around in basketball wise we've largely turned our focus to now getting caught up on soccer and then you have baseball and softball that are getting fired up. So um, as far as I'm um, just kind of taking stock in some notable uh, happenings either in soccer or one of these stick and ball sports wanted to just play a little bit of catch up there to round out the podcast. Um, and David, give you a chance to chime in. Hi guys. So, hey, what's up, buddy? How you doing? <laughs> oh, life is great. So let's see. Um, yeah, let's. Um, whether it's Capel, whether it's Lake Cities or the Colony or Little Elm, just somebody, somebody out of your coverage area. What has been um, just something within one of these springtime sports that has kind of caught your eye up to this point? Um, just the battle for the positioning for soccer. Mm-hmm. Um, you take a look at uh, District Ten Five A, uh, especially on the girls' side. Um, like Wiley East is, they've they've wrapped up that district title. You know, they, they, there's only two games remaining for each of those teams, and they're mm-hmm. three games ahead of them in the in the in the win column over the second of the second, third, and fourth place team. So they've won that district, but they've actually lost one game, and one of that was to the Colony. Mm-hmm. And the Colony right now is fighting for the second spot right there in in that in that district right there and it's it's really really tight for that district right there because like all like those three teams right there uh the like who are battling for second place the colony lovejoy and mckinney north they'll have seven wins on the year but they're like they're only separated by like one point mm-hmm. just because of like either a loss or a tie so um it's going to be interesting to see what happens this final week um like one of the big games that they have on the on the docket this this week is uh, the Colony against McKinney North, and it's a team. It's two teams that are coming in really red hot. Mm-hmm. Um, the Colony they've won three straight games, and one of those games was against Wiley East, which was last week. They beat them three to one, mm-hmm. and going into that game, 
uh, Wiley East, they allowed only two goals the entire season. Not only district, but the entire season. The Colony, they call in, they score three goals on them. So uh, the, in, the, in that game, uh, Wiley East, they get up one to nothing. They have a penalty kick. And, you know, I was on the phone with, talking with Coach Tommy Ray. And he goes, like, you know, it was a penalty kick. You know, like they did get, we did foul them in the box. It was going to be a scoring chance if we didn't foul them. Mm-hmm. So they got up one to nothing. But what he liked was the response right after that. They t- you know, they get the kickoff and they go right up the field and they score. Well, uh, Leslie Valdespino, who's one of their seniors right there, she goes up and scores and makes it one to one going in the half. And then in the second half, they get two goals from uh, their sophomore more standout Olivia Howard uh, and then one of one of the goals uh, that uh, Tommy Ray described to me uh, she said that Olivia Howard volleyed it some three times in the same play to sc- go score oh goodness so wow. yeah they go score they go up three to one and then uh, one of the other players who's uh, who's you know really helped in that game was uh, was, was her center back uh, junior Megan Gilchrist and he said like you know they she really helped to fortify that back back area in that defense in that game right there because like it's it's a it's a Wiley East team that can score mm-hmm. they've scored 96 goals on the year in 20 games wow that's so, geez. yeah so I mean and he like you know he just can't say nothing good things about her he can't say no things about their goal about their def- defense right there so I mean so with that one right there obviously it's going to build a lot of confidence so they go out the next game against Princeton and they beat them eight to nothing so now they're running a three-game win streak but they're going to be tested on Friday against a, a McKinney North team who's playing very, very good right now. And this, uh, like, like I, I covered them once this year, and it was like they were kind of a little bit of a skate earlier this season in early February. It was a team that lost three straight games right there. So you're just kind of seeing, like, you know, what's going on? How are they going to kind of bounce back? Because um, they lost three straight games to Lovejoy, the Colony, and Wiley East. And granted, all those games were really, really close. Uh, the first two were two to one, and they lost to Wiley East three to one. But then they go on this amazing streak right now they're they've won six games in a row and they and they've outscored their opponents 25 to 2 mm-hmm. so that's a team that like that lets lance lavelle their head coach has really got them you know going right there so um but obviously these two last games that they have are pretty tough they play the colony on friday at the colony and then they host a district champion wiley east at home but i mean but you, like you know, even with the opponents, like you, like confidence is such a huge thing in soccer. So I mean, they you know they can knock out, they can beat both of these teams, you know, with the way that they're playing right now. Uh, the last game that they played, um, a team that they're battling for second place right there in the district is Lovejoy, and they beat them three to nothing. So and they actually played Lovejoy like the at like the previous game because they're making up all these games because of all the weather, mm-hmm. and they beat Lovejoy like on the on. March the third, three to nothing. So, like, if you're a McKinney North fan, you got to like how the way things are going right now. Soccer can be. You mentioned it's a game that relies on confidence, man. Soccer can be a weird game sometimes too, just a strange game. And that's mm-hmm. where you know when I, um, you know, when I think back to last week. My week took a bit of an odd turn as I ended up diving headfirst into the last couple rounds of the Taps Boys Soccer Playoffs over at the Division One level, and um, got to see what was. I'd say, I mean, granted, you, you always just you try not to be a prisoner of the moment, but as far as is just how a, a wild ending to a soccer game. I didn't think that it could top um, what I saw a few years ago in Lake Dallas when their boys team, I believe the year that the Lake Dallas boys went to the regional finals, they actually began their playoff run with a crazy overtime win over Saginaw where they scored the tying goal inside the final 10 seconds of regulation and then they scored the game winning goal inside the final 10 seconds of overtime. That feels like something that's really, really hard to top. Um, so I'm going to lay this out to you because this is just what happened in John Paul's uh, John Paul II. Their state semifinal game against Trinity Christian Academy of, uh, of Addison last week in the state semifinals. So, I mean, JP was already coming off a pretty thrilling high from winning a, an overtime game via golden goal against El Paso Cathedral in the state uh, quarterfinals. And then they're playing against rival TCA, who they had split with in the regular season two meetings. Um, so TCA's pretty much in control of this thing for probably about 75% of the match. They have a 1-0 lead. John Paul's, though, they get the ball back late, and they're just trying to muster one last shot on goal. There's really nothing clean that's materializing in the box for them. But as the uh, as the final seconds are shaving off the uh, the game clock, John Paul, I believe it was their freshman, David Apple, he fires off a shot right in front of a TCA player. TCA players called for a handball just before time expires, did not get an exact count on how much time was left. The referees did not put any time back on the clock, but it was somewhere between 0.1 and then 2.0 seconds to go. But somewhere within the absolute dying seconds of this matchup, John Paul has their opponent flagged for a handball. So 
John Paul gets a penalty kick with no time left on the clock and regulation to potentially send this thing into overtime. Fitch Torres converts. We're headed to overtime in this game where just JP looked dead to rights and their season is still afloat. Well, this then goes to penalty kicks, and then John Paul is able to win in penalty kicks 3-2. to two. Um, Their goalkeeper, Michael Hamilton, had three saves in the shootout. Three saves! That is, I mean, with the, with the amount of guesswork and just kind of frankly just luck that's required in a shootout. Um, that is that is some good fortune. An absolute just insane finish to their state semifinal. A two to one victory, I guess, ultimately for JP over a TCA to advance to their first state championship game since 2016. Um, you know, the luck ran out a little bit there in the state title game, though Beaumont Kelly got up on him 2-0 within the first 15 minutes. And even though JP made it interesting late, they were able to cut that deficit in half. I believe it was Sean McGuigan who had a, uh, who had a goal with about 20 minutes left, and they got some other chances there to really, uh, you know, kind of make Kelly sweat, but un- um, ultimately unable to get that equalizer, and they lost two to one. But still, uh, still an impressive season, and one for just the nature of the way that some of these matches ended. One that uh, that program will not uh, will not be forgetting anytime soon. And then I also had one quick note just about. Um, let's see, I don't know whether to go with five six A or six six A on this one because, well, with five six A, it's. I mean, have you all taken stock in what Prosper's doing? Their girls team. Have you all seen like any of the scores like on social media? Or anything about what the Prosper yes. girls are up to this season. It's usually like five to nothing or nine to nothing. They're like they're undefeated on the year. I believe they're number one in the state, um, according to TGCA, the Texas Girls Coaches Association. They're eighteen and 9 and zero in district play. They have a goal differential, I believe, of plus one hundred and ten. <laughs> They've allowed four goals all season, and I mean, like you said, David, like most of the nights they're winning. And this is against, again, like really salty competition, like Denton Guy or McKinney Boyd. I mean, it's, there's good teams on their schedule, no Allen. doubt. Yeah, Allen. They don't, I mean, they don't play in a, in a, in a you know, in a weak district or by any stretch. But, yeah, they've, I mean, they're just absolutely just blowing the doors off teams. And, I mean, Hadley Morell and Caitlin Giametta, it feels like every night you're seeing those two scoring at least like two, three goals apiece. Like those two have probably combined for more goals this season than a lot of teams have scored in their entire Entirety all year, um, and it's not like they've just a team that's been great at front running. Like they beat Allen two to one, you know, in their first go around in district play, so they can win close games as well. But just this Prosper team is just been an absolute terror, and I'm just fascinated to see what it translates to in the playoffs because you saw some signs of this, you know, for a lot of last season as well before things got canceled. So you know, we were denied a chance to see just what that team could do in the postseason then. So, uh, but yeah, nevertheless, they're building off of it, and they look like an absolute world beater up to this point. And then you've got the situation over in 6XA where you've got six teams that are all in in striking distance for a playoff spot and all six teams are capable of beating one another it's insane. So, like, it's in, I believe, like, four or five of them have been state-ranked at some juncture this season. You've got Flower Mound in first place with 26 points, Plano in second place with 21, Marcus with 20, Capel 19, Plano West 18, Hebron 17. So you have four points separating second place from sixth. And we're getting down to the stretch where these teams have three to four matches left in their schedules. And, I mean, you're going to have two good teams that, you know, teams that have the at least the on-paper c- credentials to potentially go two, three rounds deep in the playoffs that end up not even making this thing all together. So um, some very, very fascinating soccer over these next couple weeks between uh, District 6, 6A on the girls' side. Uh, Devin, I'll get you out of here, and uh, let's uh, discuss one thing that's happening uh, over in your neck of the woods for the uh, for the springtime sports. Yeah, you know, I have some some interesting soccer races myself. I mm-hmm. mean, uh, this you know, at 9 and 6A, the Saxe and, and Wiley are tied going in. The girls are tied going into the final uh, week. Uh, Saxe and Rowlett boys is kind of a two-team battle on that side. Um, uh, you know, I, I just say boys, we got, uh, basically five teams separated by six points. And so that's going to go down to the, to the final two matches, uh, 13, five, a, uh, you know, it's kind of when you Highland parks in your district, in your soccer district. So it's kind of tough, but the West, <laughs> but the West Mesquite boys, I, I have every clinched second place. Okay. And that's going to be a fun team to watch in the playoffs. Cause I think that's They're really good that last year too, right? Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And then over in 9-5A, the girls, you got uh, Memorial, Wakeland, and Reedy separated by two points with one match left on the mm-hmm. schedule. You know, Wakeland has kind of run away with the boys, the 9-5A boys. Well, kind of, yeah, but, yeah, but, you know, just kind of solidifying themselves as a, as a state title contender. But uh, it's just been – talking with the coaches, it's been such a strange year, not just with – COVID quarantines, but with the weather we had hit oh, a couple yeah. weeks ago. So that set up a, a situation where you had some teams playing. The Saxon girls played five straight days, Tuesday through Saturday. No kidding. Wow. And, uh, and, and they 
that was the busiest, but most of those teams in 9 6 were playing. They, play, they played four times in five days, and then they had to turn around and play Tuesday, Wednesday, the next week. You know, the Frisco ISD teams have basically been playing Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, just trying to get everything in. But now, after making up all that ground, we've run into this kind of odd situation where, like, for Garland ISD and Mesquite ISD, they wrap up their district seasons later this week on Friday. So the playoffs don't start till March 25th. So they're going to go into spring break next week, and by the time they, t- they take the field for the playoffs, it's basically going to be two weeks since they've played. Frisco ISD has, is, is another kind of curious case because they just have one match left in their district season. But they're off all this week for spring break, and they'll come back that following Tuesday, play once, and then – you know, they're done for a week, basically. And it's just the way it's set up. These coaches have been trying to, you know, they, they like their routines. They, you know, they're used to, we practice these days, we play these days. And it's just been such a crazy situation with makeups and with, you know, having games shuffled around at the last second and then having to play multiple days. Um, and, you know, the coaches will say, you know, we like our routines. This has been crazy, mm-hmm. so we don't know what we're going to do. But we're also – Basically coming up on one year anniversary of when everything was ground, you know, mm-hmm. just called to a halt. So even though it's been chaotic, even though it's not the ideal schedule, uh, based on what happened last year, the coaches are very yeah. happy to deal with it and very happy that they're going to have the opportunity to play, to get into the playoffs and get this thing finished. If there was ever a year when it should just be second nature having to break from your normal yeah. routine. <laughs> so, yeah, this is just, I mean, what else is new at yeah. this point? So, yes, that is a look at um, kind of where things are at for a few few of our uh, of our teams relative to I guess the soccer picture right now as they wind down their regular season and that'll do it for this episode of the Star Local Media High School Sports Podcast probably be a hodgepodge of stuff of sorts recapping for school Liberty Girls and some cleanup from the Taps playoffs next week plus some more soccer stuff as we as we hit that home stretch so yes folks until then you take care and we will talk to y'all later <laughs>